Piercy Veg Radio is sponsored by Five Star Foodies Vegan Food and Beverages, a woman and family owned business offering burgers, sloppy joes, and cold pressed ciders that are vegan, gluten free, soy free, and non GMO. Five Star Foodies only uses unprocessed whole food ingredients to produce their amazing burgers and ciders. Our personal favorites is the tandoori spice and the fringe herb. Go to fivestarfoodies.com today to find a retailer near you. Can't find Five Star Foodies? Contact Five Star Foodies and find out how you can get your local store stocked. Curacy Veg Radio is also sponsored by Thrive Market. Thrive Market is a revolutionary online marketplace with a mission to make healthy living easy and affordable for everyone. Thrive Market members pay a low annual fee of $59.95, and that's less than $5 a month, and are currently offering free shipping on orders over $49. Give their service a try now by going to curacyvegradio.com slash thrivemarket and seeing what all the buzz is about. You're listening to Curiously Veg Radio, WCVR, featuring the vegan renegade and the geek. Speaking of... uh... Speaking of gym day. Right. I haven't hey, found bu- my why today. Hey, everybody. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, episode, uh, I believe, what are we on? Uh, on uh, 12 or 13? God, I don't even know. I think 13. So what, episode 13 of uh, of, uh, of Kirsty Veg Radio. Uh, with you, as always, is Dave the Geek and, of course, the, the beautiful and, and fantastic... You're really waiting around in that. Leave Matt's over there to shake his head. Hope the vegan <laughs> renegade. And uh, and no, uh, no more puer tea for no you. Pu- it makes I, you, I got, makes you I got excited. I'm like, I'm like, it's good interview today. It had, today. It had, had no excited. caffeine in it. It already been steeped, so it stands I, I'm still, caffeine. I, I can still be excited. So, what if uh, for those who are new to the to our YouTube world and our uh, podcasting world, how would you uh, how would you describe Curacy Veg Radio? You know what. Guess what? I don't have pulled up. I have your notes pulled up. I have them. So let's let's let, let's ad lib this one. How would you if if I, we were in an elevator, and it was I like, would try to get out. Really I would fast. I would advise you to. <laughs> but uh, how would if, and you, which elevator pitch? How, elevator pitch. How would you describe what we're doing here to someone who uh, who was? That's well, very of, simple. Well, then then let's let's go. Let's do it. You're just full of it tonight, guys. I am. You, full you of put something. him. I tell you what, guys. You put him on video. And it's 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 uh, usually usually well, animated. It, well, this it's a talk, it's a talkie, so it'd be animated. I'm just glad that you're not doing the Looney Tune frog. That's true. Because before we did <laughs> this, before we did this, and then I'll tell you what Curiously Veg is about. Before we did this, it's a, it's a loop back. It's a tr- um, we actually this started with Matt needed to have us model for he's doing the, he was painting the uh, Atlanta um, opera posters. MatthewsArt.com. So, by the way, if you want to check out his <laughs> ding, work. Ding ding ding. Um, so we had the outfits from. The opera, so we had to kind of pose for him. So Matt needed some kind of candid shots for the Barber of Seville. So Matt tried everything. He put on the the Looney Tunes song from it, and Dave's on cue. He's he's jumping around, doing all kinds of funny things. The minute Matt gets the camera, it's like the frog lays down. Yeah. So it's nothing. He's the talking frog. Yeah. So the, the concern was I was a little Looney Tunes frog on every episode. So far, I've I've You're done okay. Frog it. You're gonna Looney frog it. There's been a couple of times where I didn't what didn't know quite how to get started or. Or know where to stop. Or want to stop. Usually that's my problem. I just never know when to stop. <laughs> Story so, of your life. Right. So Curiously Veg is a movement that is meant to create a bridge between vegans, vegetarians, and maybe people who are not vegan or vegetarians that maybe still eat meat, but want to learn more about creating a healthy diet or be more compassionate or taking care of the environment. So we strive to be entertaining and informative. We What do we say with that? We, uh, we, uh, we, we uh, educate, we, what is it, what is it uh, came up with? I told you to write it down. Yes, and I did, and oh, I didn't, we, so no, 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 we educate, we don't intimidate. That's right. And as and I, I always like to say that we, we try to lead by example in positivity, which I like yours much better. Yours I good. like educating. Yours rhymes. Like well, yours that, rhymes. and I can get a little bit of an attitude. I can get a little finger wave. Off the hair to the finger side. Finger wave, a head shake. Mm. Yeah. So uh, if you're <laughs> if you're if you're new or if you've been listening to us for for uh, for a bit, except like, so we've been doing this for uh, for quite a bit quite a bit now. Um, if you'd like to subscribe, uh, if you're watching YouTube, upper right hand corner, there's a subscribe link. If uh, it'd be above you, right? Right here. Right. 
Right, right, right there, there somewhere. I think. Right above his head, right, right there. there. Somewhere yeah. there. Anyway, right there. so um, there's a subscribe link. If you click that link or if you go to curiosityvegradio.com slash subscribe, uh, also, in the, also in the show notes, uh, it'll take you to a page. So if you're on Android, Android button, iOS, iOS button, or even if you have an app already installed, it'll take you so you can subscribe. And if you're watching on YouTube, sound guy. Say, husband, when, say hey, Matt. Matt's debut. Wave at the camera, Matt. <laughs> Matt's had no food tonight. <laughs> I'm under calorie. He, we'll he was stuck. He was stuck in what? What, what, what did it default to? You're in. <laughs> this is going to change the thing. We'll just say freaking, freaking um, ingredient traffic. Yeah. <laughs> he was ingredient stuck in traffic for like an hour and a half. And uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're digging the interviews, we've done, uh, we have a fantastic one day, which we'll get to in a second. We've also talked to Dr. Garth Davis. Uh, we talked to Gene Bauer on our last episode. Um, we'll try to put a link somewhere in here or in the show notes so you can uh, check the uh, our first video out. So maybe where Hope's hands are. Or if a cat jumps on the table, we'll make it move with the cat. Something like that. There's about but, uh, three of them down here. You put a lot of work on me on that one. <laughs> but uh, if you, you like what you hear, um, if you go to curiosityvegradio.com slash support, and right about now I should be putting an annotation below the, sub- the uh, subscribe link. Um, and you, there it should, gives you options on to help the show out, uh, whether it's just buy us a cup of coffee or – Subscribe to um, uh, um, Audible or Thrive Market, anything like any of our affiliates, mm-hmm. or buy an awesome shirt. Right now we have uh, we have shirts and mugs up with artwork done by our sound guy Matt sound. Hughes, See, amazing Matt, uh, artist Matt Hughes. Again, MattHughesArt.com. He's actually that. thinking I should be drawing right now. <laughs> no, right? Are you are you secretly or are you just secretly painting in your head? I think you're secretly eating in your head. That's what you're doing at this point. So if you would, uh, CuriosityVegRadio.com slash support um, link above me somewhere and uh show notes and also in the the the, uh, video description now that that those parts are out of the way um the bits and pieces pieces. we get to the meat the meat of of it well the the, uh the we we get to the satan of it i think (laughs) the The tofu block exactly of it all and you guys are going to see me playing with my cord because i have to do something so i mean please don't we have a cat who's trying to uh get a close-up right now um, so you see the video fall over and never work again. We'll know why. <laughs> We're an action team here. Right. So uh, on the... Uh, you want to introduce who we uh, are? So today? on the on the, uh, on the the show, we have the man, the myth, the man, the myth, the legend, Robert Cheek. <laughs> so who uh, is this Robert Cheek? Uh, as if I don't know. As, as if, as, if, you do, if you don't know, which I'm highly surprised. You, you, will know, now. you will now. You will now. You're going to you know, know his name is going so to be much. a household name. <laughs> let me tell you. Um, Robert, he uh, he grew up in uh, on a farm, actually, in uh, I cannot, I cannot, uh, Cor- Corvallis, Oregon. Uh, Good he adopted, job. Yeah, thank you. He, <laughs> he adopted the vegan lifestyle in 1995 at the age of 15. And now he's a best-selling author with uh, the book Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness, The Complete Guide to Bodybuilding Your Body with a Plant-Based Diet. And he also has a book now, Shred It, uh, which we'll talk about uh, in the uh, interview. And uh, we'll have a link to where you can get the book and show notes. We'll, um, we'll put it in the description for the video. Go get the book. It's fantastic. As Robert talks about, it goes deep into uh, pretty, hey, it should, regardless of where you are, it should it should uh, speak to you. But uh, he's also a two-time natural bodybuilding champion. He's uh, he's also considered one of the most influential vegans mm-hmm. by um, Veg News, right? Veg News. Yeah, Veg yeah. News Magazine. He's a full-time vegan bodybuilder, and uh, he runs veganbodybuilding.com and fitness. He does writes books, touring, maintaining a website. Very, very busy guy, as he'll talk about. In fact, he's fixing to head off to another yeah. talk after we, you know, well, the day after we finish this. So. Yeah, he, has, he got, he got, uh, he just got done with a cruise. He yeah. was doing talks on, and now he got off, he got back on the 5th and to the 7th. So, yeah, he's heading out on the. It's like the cruise with all of my, my, I guess my heroes, and I, I'm such a germaphobe, I could not do a cruise. That's, he's claustrophobic. I'm a germaphobe, so <laughs> it would not work out for maybe one day. Maybe well. one day in a lot of Prozac. I, it, it looks interesting. Then I'm oh, like, it looks awesome. oh, it looks very, very and the cool. And food. Yeah, it's like it's like it's one of those things. You, it's one of those rare thing, rare times like you go into like a vegan restaurant. You're like, so I can eat anything in here. This is fantastic. I promise you, we're not having an earthquake. That's Ashley. St- so he's, <laughs> he's 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 rubbing his face because apparently he loves he loves uh, uh, a camera stand. Yeah. The, the the cats were were cooped up all uh, for like over an hour in the office. Mm-hmm. Um, 
yeah. doing the interview, so that we thought I'd let him out and kind of have a bit of a run. Yeah. So, so without further ado and without any more catastrophes, <laughs> we'll have our interview. All right. um, I guess it's, here uh, is our interview with the amazing Robert Cheek. Yep, enjoy it. All right, Robert, uh, thank you very much for coming on and spending time with us with on uh, on a, a Curiosity Veg Radio. And uh, I know you just got back from a cruise, so uh, I know ho- ho- hopefully you're somewhat rested. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Appreciate it, and thanks for having me. I, I am rested uh, a little bit, a little bit under the weather from uh, change in climate and, and lots of germs on board with thousands of other people. <laughs> but uh, hopefully, my voice will hang in there today. And I appreciate you having me on. Oh, thank Absolutely. you for coming. You sound great. So. Okay. so you sound fine on our end. So hopefully, hopefully we'll uh, we sound, hope you sound okay on your end as well. Mm. It's just maybe it's just something that I'm used to. My normal voice, <laughs> and I know that I'm a little bit off. That's maybe nobody else will tell. Uh, you should you should listen to our show. You'll see that I am as well. So yeah, <laughs> I'm a little quirk. I'm usually raspy after if we go if we do a lot of talk. Except <laughs> by the end of the night, I'm just I'm just like I'm not talking anymore. I'm done. Go home, get some tea. Pretty good. So that's what we're kind of nursing on now. Oh yeah, Both I got some poo air going right now. So yeah, I came straight back from the cruise and went straight to the sauna, steam room. You know, back in my old stomping ground, back in twenty four hour fitness, back where I'm used to going. You know, going, getting, hitting the weights, yeah. uh, and then just trying to sweat it out and and uh, you know clear sinuses and get right back on track. And I had a great workout yesterday. Actually, awesome. I had one of my best workouts in a while. You know, so. Slightly less than 100% after a long uh, week in the Caribbean, mm-hmm. giving lots of presentations and fitness classes and workshops and lectures and signing books and all that stuff that's part of the vegan cruise. And then right back at it for back and shoulder workout, push ups, crunches every day. So, yeah, stayed on top of it. Awesome. Yeah, I saw, I saw a, a Facebook post that, but I guess before you got on there, you went to a 24 hour fitness thing and saw a guy that's just huge. And he asked you about your vegan shirt. Come to find out he's vegan. It was a small gym. And you, how many people did you meet? Like three people that were vegan? Yeah. Yeah. It was funny. I was at this, I, I was in Coconut Grove, Florida. I've never been there before. I just looked on GPS, found a 24 hour fitness that I belong to. You know, it's a chain. I've, I've been to a hundred locations or so around the country. And I go to this gym. I see this, it's a relatively small 24 hour fitness. You know, one of those like neighborhood ones. There's, I don't know, a couple dozen people in the gym rather than 100 or 200 at a time at, at, at my current gym here in Denver. But out there in Coconut Grove, and I'm, you know, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm like 200 pounds solid. You know, I've got my tank top on that says uh, something like this body is. And on the back says vegan owned and operated. Oh, so, that's awesome. So I have this vegan tank top and I'm all veined out, you know, I'm all <laughs> pumped up. And I, but I see this big guy and, you know, I'm checking out his arms. I'm, you know, I'm admiring this guy uh, doing curls. He's got big arms, and yeah, he asked. He, he we were on a we were next to each other on neighboring machines, and he says he just says, "Hey, can I ask you about your shirt?" Um, so you're vegan, and I'm you know with confidence, I'm like you know yeah for twenty <laughs> you know for over twenty years, thinking he's like a non-vegan guy who's going to have this confrontation with me and have this discussion and all that, and he just smiled and said, uh, "27 years for me." Oh, and that's awesome. His name is Jean, uh, Jean-Pierre. Uh, he's 53 years old and just looked phenomenal. So we chatted for a while. We talked about uh, different foods that we like and the vegan community. And I, I went out and got him a, a signed copy of this magazine that I'm on the <laughs> cover of with my, my girlfriend this month. So, uh, so yeah, that, that was a, a fun, random uh, chance thing. And then, of course, and then as I was leaving, somebody – recognized me as, as well just as uh for being a vegan bodybuilder i guess and said hey are you going to be heading to the uh the raw food fe- raw uh, fruit festival in thailand this summer which i might be going to actually so that was kind of that was kind of fun then of course my girlfriend who's vegan was there too so in this little community coconut grove at noon you know 24 hour fitness there were four of us at least who were vegan and uh and later uh i went back to that gym the next day and had another vegan shirt on and somebody uh complimented me on that shirt as well uh, just some random person it was something like no animal mm-hmm. is called an it or something like that i, I forget exactly what the, the tank top is but uh, anyway uh so yeah we, we certainly feeling the love out there in florida yeah i know i here i know at our gym i have i have one shirt I, one vegan shirt i wear to the gym that has uh i'm a big metal rock rock guy and i have okay. it, say, it says uh metal made vegan on the front and the back it says death in my metal not in my not my meals oh yeah 
Yeah. I've got that shirt too. Oh, do you really? Oh, I love that one. Yeah. I, I wear that one. I kind of, I kind of look around like, yeah, that's right. See, I'm needing that shirt. I, that's I fantastic. Have, I am yeah. Sam. Yeah, that's from my uh, Drew Brozovich. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I love. Yeah, Drew, Drew's an awesome guy. He and I talk every now and then. His, 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 his stuff is really, really cool. Yeah, I saw him in uh, Portland, Oregon, at the Portland yeah. Bench Fest recently. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's he's a really really nice guy. He's doing a lot of really cool stuff right now too. When, yeah. When when, when you you said you you're kind of expecting the guy to kind of. Um, I know, kind of. When you asked about your shirt, you were kind of ready, kind of ready to I guess defend. Do you do you have that that often when you go into the gym? You know, not not a whole lot, but uh, you know, people are just curious. You know, they see a guy who's uh, pretty good shape. You know, I'm about two hundred pounds right now. I was at the gym yesterday. Like I said, I was two hundred one with clothes on, so I'm in the high one nineties. Uh, pretty strong, lifting pretty heavy weights, and so people are just curious. You know, they 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 don't they they see somebody pressing. 300 pounds on your 315 on decline bench press or leg pressing a thousand pounds or something like that. Or, you know, I, I press 120 pound dumbbells in each hand over overhead uh, for chest press. It's quite a bit of weight for my size. And so people are, uh, they're just kind of surprised when they see something like this. They see vegan written big across my shirt, my hoodie. Uh, I always wear vegan themed clothes, whether it's my own that I make like this one or those two other random vegan tank tops I was wearing in Florida or my Forks Over Knives hoodie or my Bone Breaker barbell shirt or whatever it is, uh, you know, people are curious. They do, they do ask questions. And so I'm, I'm ready to just let people know that, yeah, I've been doing this for 20 years. You know, I started as 120 pounds, peaked at 204, and I clearly get enough protein. I, you know, <laughs> these types of things. I'm just ready to answer those questions. I let them know I'm a multiple time champion bodybuilder, did that all vegan, of course, and I'm just there to answer questions. So I, I was just, in that certain situation, I was just expecting, I, I don't know why, I guess I, I was just expecting the person to uh, be curious about vegan lifestyle and turns out he's been vegan longer than me. <laughs> so you, <laughs> Almost fit, years. you went yeah. vegan at 15, right? Yeah, 15, 15 years old. How has the dynamics changed with you in the gym? Because you went from, you said you were at 120? And- yeah, I was a, I was a you know, high school kid, a skinny, long distance runner, high school kid, became vegan as I got into animal rights as a sophomore in high school. This is before the internet, <laughs> mind you. So I didn't have resources like the internet, but the uh, internet came around, uh, at least in my, in my school, we learned how to use it in 96 or 97, mm-hmm. but in, in 95, I uh, became vegan. At, my older sister was a an in, a positive influence on me for that, and kind of paved the way f- as she became vegan before I did. And and how and she organized an animal rights week at our high school, and really introduced me to the lifestyle and what it meant, and uh, showed me videos of factory farming and animal testing, and brought in speakers to talk about. Uh, about the vegan lifestyle and about animal rights and ethics, very much like I do today, uh, where I go speak at colleges and schools and festivals. Uh, she organized speakers to come 20 years ago to my school, which had that positive influence on me that led me down this path that I'm now 21 years into. Hmm. What, what what was the aha moment for you that kind of made you make that switch from non-vegan to vegan? Well, I, I think... A couple things, but for one, I grew up on a farm, and so I had animal friends that had first names. I was in 4-H program. I raised animals and showed them at the county fair, at the state fair, and at the end of that summer, I had to take them to the auction and sell them and part ways with my buddy. You know, it's like giving away your dog, giving away your cat, and then when I realized that they weren't just going to another home, they were being going to be used for food. That was a kind of a wake up call. And I, I also remember these videos my sister showed us of, you know, I grew up on a small farm. There was a dairy next to us and we had cows and chickens and rabbits and guinea pigs and goats and animals like that, ponies, horses on our farm, but it is small, you know, 20 acres. But when I saw videos of, of big factory farming, I mean, large scale factory farming and specifically I remember animal testing videos. Mm-hmm. rabbits being held down and things put in their eyes and all that that was that was really the turning point for me was just seeing this cruelty on a mass scale mm-hmm. that as a kid i said you know that, that's not something i want to be part of that's not something i want to support and even though i came from a farming background grew up on a farm all my relatives basically were were, were farmers and were on board with that uh, i decided to go a different different route and so that's what i did and that was really my aha moment, I guess, was understanding the 
large scale picture that is a lot different than a small family farm. It's kind of like Dr. Campbell. He had that kind of a similar thing growing up on a farm. Do you, do you think being on a farm kind of made this more impactful that when you really saw what was going on because you had that chance to bond with animals, it was a little different than somebody that has not had a chance to bond with any animals? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And actually, I, I just talked to Dr. Campbell a few days ago. We were He was on the vegan cruise as well, and we had a nice 30-minute conversation about our, our farming backgrounds. And, and uh, just, you know, I see him every year, and we it's fun to catch up with him. And, and he played a huge role in, in my transition to a whole food plant-based diet that I'm on these days. So, uh, so I give a lot of credit to him. And I, I think so. I think you're right. I think because I'm able to connect with farm animals in a way that a lot of other people can't or haven't been able to because I've lived with them, you know, I've, I've spent years around them, I do resonate with, uh, with animal rights and, uh, and care for animals in a different way because I, I watch them grow up. I see them go through ups and downs. I see their different emotions. I see they, they have families like the rest of us, you know, and they want to keep those families. They want to spend time with their parents or with their siblings, or they want to play. They want to live Mm -hmm. a life free of uh, fear, pain, and suffering, just like we do. And because I spent so much time around them, I was able to, to resonate, Mm -hmm. uh, with where they're coming from. That's what uh, Gene Bauer was saying. That's that's the big impact with these farm sanctuaries, which is very important. Even when he was telling the story about the, the fur farmer, you could educate these people, hand them, show them these videos, but until he came there and he, he actually was interacting with the animals, it kind of clicked with him. And I think most people, I don't think anybody wants to be involved in causing harm or suffering. And uh, it's funny because we were talking, I was chatting with a friend of mine who happens to be a hunter, and he actually said, he goes, I wonder how many people would still eat meat if they had to hunt and prepare it. It goes, I guarantee you there'd be a lot more vegans in the world if they had to, had to do that, if they actually saw and had to have a hand in it compared to when you see the animals and you interact with them. Yeah, I think so. And I think it goes beyond just animals. How many people are not sympathetic or empathetic to people suffering in third world countries? Exactly. Once you go to a third world country mm-hmm. and you see people suffering firsthand, you see people who are on the streets, uh, you see lots of poverty, you see people who are are lacking food or clean water or these types of things, it, it has a different impact on you than just out of sight, out of mind. Mm-hmm. And I think growing up on a farm it put me in a position to be really empathetic and sympathetic to animals and their and their own inherent desires to be be free and enjoy their lives. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so I, I really try to... It, encourage people to go visit farm animal sanctuaries, go, go see what farm animals are like, uh, and, and spend time with them and get to know them. And, and, uh, that's one thing that I, one of the things I really like doing, I've, I've been to all the farm sanctuary locations as far as the Gene Bowers farm sanctuary, New York and California and multiple locations in California. I've been to many other animal sanctuaries as well, including multiple animal sanctuaries in Australia, in Salt Lake City, and in Oregon, and uh, numerous other places. And uh, every time I do, every time I go spend time with rescued farm animals, I get you know, re-inspired, re-rejuvenated, motivated, fired up to go make a difference yeah. uh, because I, I have the opportunity to see them and their second chance of life. So uh, it, it just takes me back to my, my farming roots, I guess. It makes me, makes me want to work harder harder and harder and harder to make a, a positive difference. Well, I think that's the, the good thing we're seeing is with vegan bodybuilding and with the emergence of more athletes and more celebrities coming out is we're almost, we're, veganism used to be not the norm, used to be kind of the outsider. Now it's becoming seen as, as more normalized. We're learning more about it. Like we just, MMA, we just had uh, Diaz beat um, Connor uh, McGregor. And uh, he's, he, you know, he's been playing, he's actually been a raw was it raw plant based yeah, diet for a little while? He's been he's been vegan since eighteen, and he's been raw for the past like three years or so. so M- mostly raw. He you know where, where he can, but yeah. So we have we have uh, somebody that that defeated. He was undefeated. Conor McGregor was undefeated. In the UFC, yeah. And uh, so we're seeing all of these athletes, and like you said, you're going to the gym, and we're seeing more and more bodybuilders. So right. I think that's really uh, you're kind of taking the animals when you go to the sanctuary. It kind of shows compassion. Then what you're doing, what these athletes are doing, you're, is you're showing that this is you can be strong, you can be an athlete, you can recover faster. So it's kind of changing the dynamics a bit. Do you see that happening? Oh yeah, the growth has been incredible over the years. I mean, I remember when I started before the internet. 
I mean, <laughs> I didn't really know any other vegan athletes. Uh, a couple kids in high school who adopted the lifestyle with me, uh, unfortunately, didn't stick with it. But you know, I had a few vegan friends when I was in high school, a- and uh, you know, from not knowing anybody to then getting on the internet, and knowing like one or two other vegan bodybuilders, to now having a couple hundred thousand followers on our vegan bodybuilding Facebook page, mm-hmm. and tens of thousands in other social communities online and just seeing all these vegan bodybuilders and vegan athletes excelling in sports all over the place is is fantastic. I mean, Tori Washington is a mm-hmm. six-time natural bodybuilding champion. He just competed at the Arnold Classic over the weekend, uh, mm-hmm. yesterday or, or Saturday, and he finished, I think, fourth place. It was a top five in, uh, in his competition there. And uh, uh, Jahina Malik, also vegan since birth, she competed at the Arnold Classic. And I, I've actually met her, I've met her a number of times, met her mom when I've been on, on tour out in Florida. And, and uh, of course, I've hung out with Tori a bunch of times, too. These are just a couple of examples of longtime vegan athletes who competed at the very prestigious Arnold Classic competition over the, over the weekend. And, of course, you mentioned Diaz. Been, he's been vegan for, I think, 12 years or so. About that, uh, yeah. Yeah, longtime vegan athlete, and as are many MMA athletes. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't actually even follow MMA, but I just I hear about the athletes all the time because I'm involved in the vegan athlete scene. So uh, I, I'm so closely involved in the vegan athlete community. I hear about all these MMA guys that I don't follow the sports, so I don't know how famous they are. I barely even heard of Nate Diaz, and here I see you know yeah. he's one of the best in the world. And I was actually in Vegas uh, uh, a few months or a couple months ago, and and Connor was fighting the day that I was there at MGM Grand. People, <laughs> people from. Uh, I was like, what's, what's going on with this? all these Irish flags? And people were like, like, what is going on? I had no idea the, the MMA, whatever it was, you know, 190 something or whatever it was, was going on that same day that I was there. And what, what's really funny about, about Connor is his, uh, his whole fight camp. They were talking about how he's been eating uh, steak for breakfast, lunch, and dinner to bulk up and get muscle. To, and, and they actually called Nate like a, like a, gra- a grazing gazelle waiting to get pounced on by a lion. The memes have been fantastic. Oh, like, how's that? How's that gone for you? Yeah. You, you, yeah. You, you, you were talking about um, uh, uh, the vegan athletes, especially. In, you know, we had talked earlier about uh, your uh, your lifting. You have the uh, you have shred it. Yeah. And yeah, I got a copy here, and we have the yeah. vegan bodybuilding and fitness book there. Yeah. yeah. Was, yeah. And they're they're both actually I, I, they're they're excellent. I noticed that the shredded is more tailored to everybody. Yeah. Compared yeah, to the exactly. first one, and I, I think it's got really good information. Which I have a lot of people going. I don't want to be a bodybuilder, so what do I do? So I, I, I show them your book because like, you can translate this. What, what advice do you have, or what, what kind of spurred you to write Shred It? Yeah, well, you know, I wrote. I had my ten-year career in bodybuilding, basically about two thousand one until two thousand nine or ten, and I decided to take a break and, and write about my experiences. I had won multiple bodybuilding competitions. I'd come in second a bunch of times. I had I had been exposed to lots of media outlets, television, newspaper, magazines, and all these different things. I I, I had a lot of stories to tell and a lot of advice to share because I grew from 120 pounds to 195 pounds uh, over the course of a relatively short period and, and found some success in bodybuilding. So I, I wrote the book, Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness, 300-something page book. And I went out on tour with that for a while, but you, you know, it, like you said, it, it's it's kind of bodybuilding specific, and not everybody wants to uh, bulk up and, and be this this big bodybuilder guy. And so, uh, when I took Dr. Campbell's plant based nutrition certification course through Cornell University, it's I think now called the Center for Nutrition Studies at E Cornell, that changed my perspective on a lot of different things: mm-hmm. uh, protein intake, supplementation. Uh, calorie intake, whole foods versus processed foods, uh, a variety of different topics. And it was after that course that I decided that I would write a new book about my new ideas, my current ideas, my current philosophies, my current approach. And that's where Shred It came, came from. And I'm very uh, pleased and, and fortunate that I got it endorsed by Dr. Campbell, mm-hmm. as well as Dr. Esselstyn and Forks Over Knives and many others. And you're right that it is geared toward anybody. I mean, anybody who wants to burn fat, build muscle, increase endurance, be consistent, accountable, transparent, and achieve goals. This is the book that I spent two years writing, 30 peer reviews from, I mean, top people, Dr. Gregor, Dr. Mm-hmm. Esselstyn, Campbell, Forks Over Knives, all Kathy Freston, Juliana Hever, 
uh, George Eisman, registered dietitians, I mean, real experts, real scientists, real experts. Uh, and it also, you know, I've got it right here, it also features dozens of other plant-based athletes. And that's a, a huge aspect of the book, too, where it's not just me and my ideas. It's, uh, it is endorsed by these great doctors and professionals as well as featuring dozens of other plant-based athletes to show there's a lot of people doing it, including people that are almost twice my size. So, oh, And thank you for giving me a mention of that. I was, you, my husband was laughing at me because I was, I, I just got, I was reading through it and I looked through the back. I was like, took a double take. I was like, holy crap. <laughs> I, got, I, I, got, I got a message on, message on Google chat. She's like, I'm in the book, I'm in the book. Like, yeah. Okay, yeah. Br- first, I, first breathe. <laughs> But yeah, I was like you. I took I, I took Dr. Campbell's yep, course. I see, it, I see it right there, page 327. There you are. Yeah. <laughs> Giving me the endorsement, yeah. But yeah, I took Dr. Campbell's. It's like with me, I, I thought I knew a lot until I took that course. And it really wakes you up. It, it makes you reconsider. You know, everybody thinks like with, he knows when you go to the gym, you're downing the shakes. They're like 200 grams of protein or you're taking handfuls of supplements. And you, you then when you learn about the science, which is, you know, you, you do talk a lot about, you know, how to do that in your book. It yeah. really makes you aware of how efficient our bodies are if we get out of the way and we do the right things and give it the right fuel, which plant-based does. Right, exactly. What I really wanted to communicate was that regardless of what your objectives are, what are regardless of what your goals are, burning fat, building muscle, improving endurance, excelling as an athlete, you can do that by eating real food. Mm-hmm. You, can, you can achieve those specific goals by understanding the components of real food, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, nitric oxide, uh, essential fatty acids, things like that, and eat the foods that supply ample quantities of those, of those nutrition components, and you set yourself up for success, mm-hmm. while also understanding things like basal metabolic rate, Harris Benedict equation, how many calories are you really expending every day? How many calories are you really consuming? And what's the nutritional net gain at the end of the day? Are, are you eating processed foods? Are you eating whole foods? And what's the breakdown there? And what's your nutritional return on investment? And I think when we understand those core ideas, we have the ability to control our weight loss, weight gain, muscle gain, fat loss, um, improvement in endurance, things like that. We actually take control over it because we understand the science behind it and our behaviors and habits will dictate specific outcomes, either positive or negative. So we can be really consistent. We can consistently follow bad behavior mm-hmm. and that, you know, bad nutritional behavior or lack of exercise and that will lead to a specific outcome. Mm-hmm. Or we can follow consistent behavior that's positive habits daily exercise, uh, plant-based whole foods for the majority of our calories, eating a caloric intake that is in line with our specific goals of fat burning or muscle building or maintenance, and we can see the positive results. So I'm really big on consistency, accountability, and transparency. And uh, and this book, I think, does a fantastic job of laying that out for people. So we really do achieve goals, and we can have a positive impact, feel good about ourselves, lift others up, and have this trickle-up effect that inspires other people and saves lots of lives along the way, human and non-human animal lives. Oh, yeah. We're talking about consistency and uh, we're talking about calories and diet and things like that. How, how does yours, how would you suggest a, a, the diet change, be, if at all, between a off day and an on day when it comes to lifting? Yeah, well, on your lifting days or your exercise days, Maybe you're not a lifter, but you're a runner or whatever. On your exercise days, you clearly you burn more calories. Maybe you burn 500 to 1,000 more calories, depending on, on the, the type of workout you do and the duration of that workout. So, you know, you can your caloric intake can be a little bit lower on off days if you're not you're not burning as much. Uh, if you're if you're trying to avoid gaining too much, uh, right. you know, extra body fat or just extra weight, or you want to limit your calorie intake but if you're really trying to bulk up you know and I've I've been through those phases where I put on 30 pounds in a single year where my goal is to bulk up and I'll put on muscle and fat at the same time where I'll just keep the calories high even on the off days anyway so then I have a surplus that accumulates and compounds throughout the rest of the week so you're going to have ups and downs some days you're going to have a, a great caloric intake another day you're on an airplane all day and you're you're just your diet suffers a bit or you're you're traveling via some other mode of transportation or you're just, I don't know, you're, you're, you're busy, you're feeling under the weather, your appetite isn't quite as strong, 
And so if you are trying to, let's say, bulk up and add mass and good quality muscle, then you want to keep your calories high even on your off days because you just want that to accumulate and compound to lead to a net gain result. And as long as the days that you are in the gym, let's say you have five days on, two days off, you're working really, really hard, compound multi-joint movements, dumbbells, barbells, free weights, body weight exercises, then you should see those, those muscle building results. So I think it really depends on your personal objective. I know that's kind of a, a, a <laughs> the general, but yeah, it makes, yeah, it works. If you're trying to burn fat, I would keep the calories lower on your off day. If you're trying to bulk up, I would keep them the same. Uh, based on what your uh, your true caloric expenditure is and what your daily targets are. So if you burn 2,500 calories a day and, and you're trying to bulk up a little bit and you're eating 2,800 or 3,000 calories a day, I, w- I would keep it about the same if you're bulking up. Trying to burn fat, you know, uh, make it a little bit lower, you know, drop, drop it by a few hundred calories uh, on days that you're not exercising. I was reading about you, you eat a lot of bananas before you work out. That's one yeah. thing I hear is, oh, don't eat fruit because it's got so much sugar and you're going to get fat. Because I'm, you know, before I work out, I usually see me with an apple or a banana I'm, and I'm out the door. But do you get that a lot? Is as many as you eat, do you get people just kind of looking at you like, why are you eating all that? Because fruit will make you fat. Uh, no, not, <laughs> not really. You know, I, I use that as fuel. I, uh, I just tossed out some banana peels that were in my car a second ago <laughs> uh, that I was eating just running some errands. But And I've got a few, I think three more bananas in the car because I'm heading to the gym later on. Mm-hmm. And I, I eat bananas during the workout too because at the moment I'm trying to add mass. I'm not, I'm not worried about uh, burning fat right now. If I was trying to burn fat, I would not eat during the workout because I, w- I would want to burn through my stored glycogen, mm-hmm. uh, stored carbohydrate, and, uh, and then eventually get into a fat burning zone where I'm using fat as fuel. But right now because I'm trying to just get the, the most out of my workouts, so I have the most energy – to uh, get the best pump, to be at my strongest, then I will. I will eat bananas during the workout. And, you know, I just sit there, peel them in the gym and just eat, you know, toss the peel and, and go, about my, go about my day. And no one really, <laughs> really says anything or, or mentions anything. I just carry them around in my gym bag and, and use them. Or oranges, you know, little tangerines I'm peeling and eating during the workout. They, they, but, it's always like with us. It's like you can tell the vegans because even when he came in, he, he, he comes and goes, that's a lot of bananas because we, we, you can always see, cause we, especially if you go to Trader Joe's where they're cheap, we just kind of pile them on coming out with bags of bananas. Like, you eat a lot of bananas. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, they're good. Well, it's like it's almost the, the perfect exercise food. I mean, I mean it's, they're about 70 to 90 calories depending on the size. They're, they're kind of dense and heavy as far as fruits go, I mean, they're much heavier than the raspberries or watermelon mm-hmm. or right. yeah. uh, blueberries or any other you know, oranges or any food like that. So they're a heavy, dense, uh, tasty, nourishing fruit. And so, I mean, I'm going to feel much more full from having two or three bananas during my workout than a handful of blueberries or raspberries or a few chunks of mango or something like that. So banana it seems to be one of the best foods for sustained energy during a during a workout and it's something that's light on the stomach so it's mm-hmm. not going to upset my stomach like if i were to have a sandwich or a burrito <laughs> during the workout well that's interesting you said you eat uh, bananas during your workout and something i've always been told over and over again is you shouldn't eat so close to a workout or during a workout because it pulls blood to the stomach and you're not going to get as much pump into the muscle from the blood is that is that something you don't you, it, it is not true or you don't see a problem with i don't see a problem with it I think if I eat something heavy, that could be problematic. So I, yeah, if you eat like a like I just mentioned, a sandwich or a burrito or a bowl of rice or or potatoes right before a workout, uh, yeah, it could upset the stomach. It could be it could be a problem. Um, but I'm not doing a lot of movement during my workouts. I'm mostly just lifting weights, <laughs> sitting one spot, yeah. and sitting on a bench. You know, I'm pressing and sitting on a bench. I'm not like. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not running around <laughs> bouncing. If I were, if I were, and I do those workouts sometimes. Yeah. I do these total body, high intensity cardio conditioning workouts, and that's what I lead on the cruise ship. You know, lots of jumping jacks mm-hmm. and star jumps and high knees and all that. If I eat before that, yeah, my stomach goes crazy <laughs> because right. food is bouncing around, blood's bouncing around. Uh, but if I'm just lifting weights, it's it's really easy. You know, I just walk around. Just doing some rows. I feel better now then, yeah. And then I just then I just sit and, you know, rest for a minute or two and go back after it again. 
So, uh, so no, I have no problem, no problem uh, adapting to consuming food during my workouts. I've been doing it for, for years. And it's and, working. So yeah, yeah for, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> for, uh, there's there it is. There it is. There there it is. Yeah. There. It's hard to fit the whole forearm in. So just, <laughs> just, remember, just remember, Dave, bananas and not those bars that you ate before I put you through HIIT training where you were over in the corner about to die. Oh, yeah. No, that wasn't that wasn't good. I did a Tabata <laughs> set with him. I had and... a little protein bar that didn't settle settle that well. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. Th- those are, you know, bars are a couple hundred calories per yeah. bar. They're, they're nuts. Are, are a big part of those calories, right. and those can be pretty heavy. I mean, if, if I eat something like Laura Bar... Vega snack bar, whatever, before a high intensity Thanks cardio workout. Yeah, then I'm, you know, I'm feeling it in my stomach too. I, I wish I would have had just a banana, not hundreds of calories of Lara bars. <laughs> well, you, 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 can't, you talked a lot about calories and things like that. So, uh, like Tory Washington doesn't uh, count his macros, how much protein he gets, and all that. Do you worry so much about macros or just, just, just making sure you get the calories regardless of where they're coming from? Or Yeah, you know, um, in Shredded, I talk about having a like a 70 15 15 approach 70 percent of calories coming from carbohydrates 15 percent from proteins and fats do i document everything these days no you know i've been doing this for 20 years i have a pretty good idea of my caloric intake and so i kind of go on feel much like tori does but because there are millions and millions of people who have no idea what they're consuming they have no idea how many calories are in especially the processed foods that are loaded with oil and refined carbohydrates and uh, wheat and, and, and breads and things like that, that uh, they need to know. They need to mm-hmm. document the stuff for at least a couple of weeks to know what they're consuming. I mean, I, I give these lectures all the time and I, and I share with audiences that there are, there are people in this room right now who, based on their gender, age, height, weight, and very importantly, activity level, should be eating, let's just make up a number, 2,300 calories a day in order to maintain weight. Yet these, yet these, these people with this objective of what they should be consuming in order to maintain or maybe even lose a little bit are consuming 3,500 calories a day without knowing it. They, they have no idea how many calories are in the, the pastries and desserts and refined foods. And so they're having this surplus of 1,200 calories a day, which is not just 1,200 calories a day. It's nearly 10,000 calories a week, nearly 400,000 calories over the course of a year of excess. And this is why we slowly and steadily gain fat, gain weight, get out of shape. Uh, this happens to millions of people. People who give up on their New Year's resolutions within after two weeks in January. The most common day globally is January 17th that people yep. give up on their New Year's resolutions because uh, a lot of people don't understand how their behaviors relate to their end goal. And they say, yeah, I'm, I'm working hard. You know, I'm a hard worker. I'm working hard. I'm eating pretty healthy. They, they think eating healthy is a, a salad covered with 600 calories of fat. <laughs> dressing. Right. You know, they have more fatty than a pizza or a burger, mm-hmm. but they pat themselves on the back for having a salad. And so that's, that's why I do talk about documenting caloric intake mm-hmm. and, uh, and the macronutrient breakdown because the average fat consumption in America is somewhere between 33 and 37% of calories. That's huge. And clearly we have a problem Mm -hmm. with uh, obesity and, and, and issues related to that in our, in our country and around the world. And our protein intake is somewhere between three and six times what it, what it should be. And our, as far as the average American diet and our carbohydrate intake is significantly lower than it should be. And that's where with complex carbohydrates from whole foods, that's where we get the highest percentages of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, fiber, water, all these things that are hugely important. And so when we have a high fat or high protein, or at least two, three, six times the, the national uh, or, or, or the, requir- the real requirement, uh, we deprive ourselves from the nutrients we would get from complex carbohydrates that we're limiting because we give carbohydrates a, a bad reputation, associating them with bread and pasta and chips and pastries and things like that, which I don't even consider carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are real foods, mm-hmm. Th- things like fruits and vegetables and grains and legumes. So do I keep track of everything these days? No, but I do know that based on my gender, age, height, weight, activity level, you know, so I'm about six feet tall, uh, 36 years old as of a few days ago. Happy birthday to me. Oh, happy birthday. Uh, happy birthday. Awesome. Yeah. Appreciate it. March 2nd. 
Um, so six foot tall, uh, 36 years old, um, probably about 197 pounds right now. I was 201 yesterday with clothes on. So about 197. It counts. It and, still counts. It's good. Uh, and working out uh, five days a week in the gym plus push-ups and crunches seven days a week. When you factor all that in, I burn about 3,240 calories a day. So that's significant to know because I have roughly – that means that I have to eat – 3,240 calories ish to stay around 197. Now, if I get injured and I stop going to the gym and my enthusiasm goes down, my caloric intake goes down because I'm not burning as many calories, so I'm not having to eat as much, I'm not, I'm not stimulating my appetite as much, I'll naturally just lose weight. I mean, my body will go all the way down to 175 or so mm -hmm. because that's, as a former distance runner, that's where my body likes to go, down to 170 pounds. And, but if I want to bulk up, and I want to continue to add mass. I was 204 pounds a month ago before a really crazy travel schedule over the last four weeks. Uh, my caloric intake was higher. It was over 4,000 calories and, because that's going to put me, that surplus, in a position to add mass. So the reason I, I, I say all that is that if somebody does have a specific objective, I mean, obviously, somebody like Tori is a, is a champion bodybuilder, knows his body very, very well. Same with Derek Tree Size. Giacomo Marchese, uh, Mindy Collette, Danny Taylor, many others. Mm -hmm. They know their bodies really well. But the average person doesn't. Mm -hmm. The average person doesn't know what their caloric intake is. They don't know what their caloric expenditure is. And that's why I think it's important to at least research that and document it for yourself. And the best way to do that is use a basal metabolic rate calculator and a Harris-Benedict mm -hmm. calculator. And this will tell you, based on your metrics, how many calories you're expending, then you decide how much to consume based on what you want to do. Bulk up, lose fat, stay mm -hmm. the same. That's one thing I've, I've seen with a lot of people is they're so scared of calories and they're scared of carbs. So for somebody that they're sometimes are resistant about doing their measurements, they, they just want, they want the, they just want you to hand them something. So I recommend them just doing a journal. And when I say you're not eating carbs, you're eating fat. And you're not eating, you're, you're, some days you're not even eating enough. You're, you're, I'm looking at maybe, you know, 900 calories here in this day and you're, you're active and that's working against what you do. And it, it's almost like they turn their head, but they're so scared to really look at what they need and kind of take it from there because we we're bombarded with all of this information of carbs are bad and this is bad and lower your calories. Sure. Well, I think the, the root underlying cause that you're probably getting at is that most of us don't want to know what the reality is. Mm -hmm. you know, we, want to, we, we want to be able to find justifications for our poor habits. You know that, uh, well, I want to eat oil because of this reason. It's, uh, some studies show that it's good for me. Um, you know, I just, I want to eat these pastries. I like the way they taste. Um, I don't want to know how many calories I'm consuming. I just, I don't want to know because that reality might make me feel bad. That might make me question my own work ethic and my own willpower and my own abilities to adapt and change. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to change. I'm you know, relatively healthy. I really like the taste of chocolate or of uh, you know, whatever the food is. You know, I really like fried food or I really like dessert every single day. I just do. And I don't want to change that behavior. And I'll deal with the consequences if there are any consequences. And I'm not even convinced there are consequences. I think my excess weight gain is because I hurt my knee and I wasn't able to train as much or whatever. You know, it's, it's that type of mentality that, yeah, most of us don't want to know how many calories we're consuming. We, we'd rather not know. We don't want to know um, how – we don't want to admit how inactive we might be because uh, we might feel bad about that. And – as long as we can keep on going with the status quo and, and just keep on keeping on, we're, we're okay with that. And, and that's okay, but that mentality is not going to get us to excel. You know, we're not going to achieve high levels of success. We might succeed a little bit, but we're not going to achieve high levels of success with that mentality. And I think one of the things you touched on, I, I write about this in Shred It, I talk about in a lot of my lectures, is that we want – we want a 100% return on a 40% investment, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yes. I want to get fit now. I want to get healthy now. Right. I want to achieve this. I'm only going to give up one thing, though. I'm only going to change one behavior, yet I want it all. I want all the success of ripped abs, big chest, you know, big muscles, whatever the case is, and uh, 
but I'm only willing to change the small amount, and that's not how it works. So what do you, just, just a quick okay. thing, what do you recommend when you have that, when you see that resistance with people? What are some tips that you can give for those that maybe that's going, yeah, that's me, but I don't want to admit it. So what, what, what are some things that people can do to help overcome these roadblocks? I think we have to ask the question, why, as many times as possible. You know, why does fitness matter to you? You know, who cares? Uh, why do you want to change? You know, why do you want more energy? Why do you want less body fat? Why do you want to be stronger? You know, who cares? You have, to, you have to be able to answer that. You have to be able to answer that for yourself and find your own meaning behind it. And, and I remind people that think of anything you've ever wanted to change. You know, how, do you, how do you get smarter? How do you learn a language? How do you learn auto mechanic skills? How do you learn technology and computer skills? You do it by applying yourself. How do you run a marathon? Not, not training every once in a while. You do it every single day. You want to speak fluent Japanese or German or Spanish or Mandarin? Well, don't, don't practice once a week and tell me that's your best effort. Uh, you know, you want to go over to Tokyo and speak fluently, you better practice every day. Well, the human body has to have the same response. You want to lose weight? You want to get bigger and stronger? You want to win races as an endurance athlete? Well, then you've got to put yourself in a position to do so. And so that's what I really communicate with people is that I use those expressions like put yourself in a position to succeed. If you want to go speak fluent Japanese in Tokyo, does it make sense to practice German five days a week? No. So if we plan to burn fat, does it make sense to continue to eat heavily processed, refined foods, foods that have lots of oil in them, which is 4,000 calories per pound? Does it make sense to eat that way and expect those results? Absolutely not. Uh, if you want to get bigger and stronger, but you're not willing to... Uh, go to the gym on a regular basis and do resistance training. You just feel like doing jump rope. Uh, is that going to build bigger shoulders, arms, legs? No. Uh, one has to put one in a position to, to be successful in order to become successful. So find your why. Find your why and understand that things compound and mm -hmm. that consistency is the most important thing in the world because it leads to adaptation, it leads to improvement, it leads to success. And transparency is more important than anything. You know, we say, oh yeah, I had a great workout today. Well, tell me about yesterday's workout. <laughs> <laughs> what happened hey, yesterday? Hey, you know, I'd rather not talk about yesterday. What about the day before? You know, ease up off my back. Come on. You know, we're talking about today. Guilty. And I say this, I say this stuff all the time in my lectures. I'm, I'm like, we, well, again, go back to the pat on the back. You know, I had a salad today. Well, great. Well, maybe the last salad you had was August. You know, uh, <laughs> it's, 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 we remember these great things that we do. You know, today I, I, I went running today. Well, good. First time in three months. Um, that, that's a good, <laughs> good first step. It's a good yeah. first step, but don't, don't, let's not give ourselves too much credit as far as, right. you know, where we're trying to get to. You know, I think, yes, we all have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we need to take some small steps at first, but those small steps lead to bigger steps and consistency, adaptation, improvement over time. And we just have to be, I think we have to be totally transparent about that accountability if we're going to succeed. When someone is, whether it's like to your point, whether it's learning Mandarin or German or going to the gym, right? even when, when someone who's really hard setting their goals, you have days where, I mean, I know I do, you're like, you just, you, you, you kind of just, you're not, you're not feeling it. You know, you have days where you, you, you walk in the gym and you're not feeling your strongest or you have days you're just feeling kind of tired or weak. And it, uh, what do you do? We just, we just, would you suggest someone do to kind of get that motivation and get kind of that, that fire underneath them to kind of push and go? He just calls me. It says, I don't want to do the gym today, and I just can't go to the gym. <laughs> you know, I've had a lot of those days. Uh, during my nearly 10-year competitive bodybuilding career, there were countless days I didn't, I didn't feel like going to the gym. I just didn't want to. I mean, bodybuilding became a chore, something I had to do because that was my reputation. That was my identity. If I wanted to succeed and win bodybuilding competitions, I had to dedicate hours a day. And oftentimes I was – following back then a low carbohydrate diet. I just didn't feel like it and I didn't want to go. But I've always been able to picture multiple steps ahead. You know, today just sucks. I don't feel like it at all. I would just, I'd rather do anything than go to the gym. I'd rather just check Facebook notifications. I'd rather take a nap. I would rather just go eat a bunch of comfort food. I would, I would, I'd rather do all these different things, but I'm able to connect the dots ahead of time and say, you know, Robert, if you can just stick with it today, get through today, then you can get through tomorrow and you can get through the next day and eventually you're going to get that goal. I mean, I, I had dreams of becoming an author. 
you know, best-selling author. I had dreams of winning bodybuilding competitions. I had dreams of getting on magazine covers and being on TV and all this stuff. Some of these are somewhat materialistic, you know, being out there in the spotlight and all this. But they're, they're things that I wanted from when I was a kid. And I wanted to do it to make a difference. I wanted to stand up and represent some sort of cause. And I was able to do every single one of those things and many more things. And those are hard things to do. It's not, it's not easy to write a book. And it's not easy to sell lots of books. And it's not easy to win bodybuilding competitions, uh, especially you know, a long time ago when there weren't a lot of people who were vegan doing it. And you had to kind of learn your own way of doing it in, in the mainstream sport of bodybuilding, just navigate your own way. But I was always able to see that what I do today is going to affect tomorrow. And I'll tell you, it, there were times when I first started. I mean, can you imagine? You know, I was, by, I was about 150 pounds by the time I, I gave up cross-country running in college. And so I was 20 years old, about 150 pounds. But I was six feet tall, 150. And when I first started lifting weights, I mean, tiny little, tiny little weights, tiny little arms. But I, but I knew that I would adapt over time. You know, it was frustrating at first. Easiest thing in the world is to give up. You know, this isn't in the cards for me. It's not my genetics, not my DNA. You know, Robert, you're a really good runner. Just stick with it and maybe make a, a, some success out of that. But so my advice for anyone is just you've got to be able to see the big picture. You've got to be able to see a few steps down the road or even many steps down the road. I've, I, I, I like this idea of connecting the dots ahead of time. So... So yeah, you don't feel like it. You're tired. You just travel across the country. You're you're bored. You're feeling sick. You're under the weather. You're whatever. Um, there are definitely times when rest is is called upon, such as when you are feeling a little bit sick. Maybe uh, it's a good idea to keep germs at home, not take them to the gym, and just and just rest <laughs> up. But for those times when you just mentally, psychologically don't feel like it, like oh, I'm just I just don't feel like it today. I'm kind of tired, or I'd rather do something else. That's when you've got to pick yourself up and say, you know what? The discipline that I can exercise today, the discipline that I can display today is going to help me later on. It may not even, it may not even help me in fitness, but it's going to help me in work. It's going to help me in my career. It's going to help me in relationships. It's going to help me in some area of life that if I can show myself that I'm strong enough to do this workout today when I don't feel like it, that I'm strong enough to handle difficult situations later on down the road in life in general. That's what I would say. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, Fantastic. It, 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 the one thing that I can say is um, when I first started to, to get into fitness, I, I kind of started in high school. My husband actually is the one that introduced me to weights. We had the old Arnold book dusted off and yeah, um, yeah. I'd always been interested in it. And when I left, when I graduated, I didn't want to go into marketing, just didn't want to sell my soul. And I, I went to get my trainer's license, but I was like, I felt like I was the only vegan trainer Then I found you. So I found I found my why, but I also found you as a role model and started going, you know, this this is doable. This is here. And I, I you know, I grabbed your book. I started following, you know, vegan bodybuilding and stuff. And I know <laughs> and, 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 and I, like I said, shred it, shred it's excellent for that. And I know Dave wanted to ask um, what it, who inspires you? Yeah, good. Good question. Uh, you know, different people than you'd expect, I think. Uh, you know, a lot of people expect to say Arnold and all these bodybuilders, and that's not necessarily the case. You know, I, I was inspired by my older sister Tanya, uh, who introduced me to the vegan lifestyle. Uh, she was an integral part in my development as a vegan athlete, and and still continues to serve as a huge inspiration today. She's been vegan for twenty something years and continues to be a great role model. Uh, America's greatest running legend, Steve Prefontaine, who passed away before I was even born. Uh, he came from a small town in Oregon. He's, he's from my region. Uh, I was exposed to his life, you know, through various documentaries and movies when I was a high school runner, and that really spoke to me about uh, about drive and passion and work ethic and and being the best that you can be. So, you know, some some of my high school teachers, Eric Daisy, John Bullock. Those are those are my role models, and I just bumped into w one of them uh, when I was back home for the holidays, and and then another one I was uh, in touch with via email just recently too. So those have really been a lot of my my role models, not not necessarily famous bodybuilders, um, or or even other vegan bodybuilders necessarily, because I 
most of my inspiration came from when I was a kid. And there weren't a lot of other vegan athletes, so I, I so I never had those vegan athlete role models. Lately, I've I've uh, I've had other people become role models. You know, I like Derek Treesize, Tori Washington, Jack Marchese, people like that. Um, but in the early days, when you really ask who inspired me, it, it really was those people that were a little bit closer to me in my life, my my family, my teachers, uh, my athlete role models from my from my region. That's what got me going, and uh, and today, um, you know, there are plenty of vegan athletes who inspire me. Brendan Brazier has been a great role model. Um, Rich Roll, uh, mm-hmm. Tim Van Orton, um, you know, there, there's a bunch of them really, uh, but they came they came much later, I would say. Excellent. Yeah, I know. Uh, for me, like I, I, me, I always found like teachers and people close to me as well. Even person sitting next to me is a fantastic inspiration. She's the one that. I used to debate her about a plant-based diet, and now she kind of like convinced me that I was wrong, and I need to actually, make, make, he, make my adjustments. He actually looked up stuff to argue with me and realized he couldn't argue any points with me. He finally admitted that. Yeah, <laughs> He's I was like, like, "All right, you're right." No, <laughs> but uh, one thing, I, one thing we definitely want to always try to ask is if uh, and this is a bit of a two-parter this time. Uh, first, if you could write a letter to yourself before you went plant-based, what would you say? Oh man, uh, I've never had that question before. Um, you know, I think I would. I think I would talk a lot about compassion, and and I would probably mention some of my animal companions by name, and and draw some parallels or similarities to a uh, quest for uh, freedom and just a life of fun and pleasure and fear of, uh, free of uh, fear, pain and suffering. And I think I would talk about that. I would talk about giving, uh, giving farm animals a second chance, uh, and trust that I could still achieve my fitness goals later on in life while following that same lifestyle. Because when I first adopted a plant-based diet or vegan lifestyle in 1995, that was one of my biggest concerns. I wondered, can I really you know, I wanted to be a pro wrestler back then, like Hulk Hogan. Uh, can I really, can I really achieve that? You know, can I get, can I be this big, strong character on TV? I wasn't sure that I could, and uh, so I guess if I were to write a letter to myself, maybe way back when I was fourteen or fifteen, I would let myself know that, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna do a good thing for your animal friends. Um, they may not be able to thank you for it, but you know, it's gonna enhance their lives. And you can still become a, a bodybuilder someday, or a pro wrestler someday, or a champion <laughs> athlete someday, uh, by following that path. So I think that's what I would tell myself. And and, and you're also the uh, founder of uh, Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness. Uh, yeah. What, what when you what would you say to yourself when you when you're first starting on uh, on that adventure? Yeah, you know I <laughs> I started that in 2002, so I was 22 years old. And, uh, you know, I thought it was going to be, it was going to be pretty big time. You know, I thought I'd sell, sell so many t-shirts and write books and do all this stuff and, and become this great entrepreneur because I've, al- I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur as well. In addition to being a, a vegan athlete and all the things that I've mentioned, being an author and pro wrestler and all these different things, I really wanted to be an entrepreneur and, and, and create stuff. I, even when I was a kid, I was making my own board games. I was, uh, uh, planning on cultivating my own land, you know, on the farm. I wanted my own little plot so then I could do my, do my stuff and, and get a return on investment on it. And I start, I, I used to work on cruise ships and I left that lifestyle at age 22 or 23 in order to pursue my own business. You know, I, so I built my own business, vegan bodybuilding and fitness, vegan bodybuilding.com in 2002. And, and I expected great things. And it was a, it was a humbling experience for years as I, even when I wrote my first book, Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness, you know, I got turned down by every publisher I sent it to. So I eventually self-published. And then I went out on tour and I ran out of money and I, I slept in my car in nine different states. And, uh, and I hit, you know, I hit rock bottom in, in my own head until I had a heart-to-heart talk with uh, Gene Bauer. I was actually out at Farm Sanctuary, again, sleeping in my car um, out in the parking lot. And uh, had a good talk with Gene Bauer and Annie Pio. And uh, decided I would turn my book over to a 
a, uh, a smaller vegetarian publisher out of Tennessee that was interested in my book, which is what I did. And, uh, you know, that's, and then I went back to the, the drawing board and had to continue to learn to grow and, and develop and improve with my own business. So I guess if I had to go back and, and tell myself, um, a, a story for the future would just to be, just to be incredibly patient and to be resilient and just to work really, really hard. I've always felt that I, I spent my twenties working more hours than anybody else I knew. You know, I worked 12 hours a day. I used MySpace as a business platform, for example, back in 2003 and I helped MySpace. grow my website and yeah, <laughs> I, I, I produced a documentary way back then, 2005 with Brennan Brazier and Tanya Kay and I used MySpace to recruit the, the vegan musicians for the soundtrack and, and numerous other aspects of that film and went on to film festivals and then would later write books. And, and I still never really, never really made it, um, for, for a, a really long time. I mean, it took until basically when this thing came out a year ago, I, until I started getting offers to speak in Australia and all these other places and, and really start making the business work. But it, I mean, what is that? 2002 until 2000. 15. So it was a, it was a long, it was a long road. So I would just tell myself to be patient, work incredibly hard, collaborate with others, uh, don't give up and, you know, follow your passion and do it for the right reasons, make a positive difference in the world, save a lot of lives along the way and things will likely work out in the end. Fantastic. That's fantastic. Absolutely. You found your why and then <laughs> found you found, my- you found your how. <laughs> So. And I'm still discovering it. You know, I'm still discovering what new passions are out there and, and how I can be more effective and what other causes are even closer to my heart, you know, the very specific ones. And I think I think that's part of the journey is to continue to uh, ask within and look within and find out what inspires you and moves you and, and how you can contribute to m- make a positive difference. So it's, a, it's an ongoing quest to okay. discover that why. That's fantastic. And, uh, you know, I definitely see this going on and being more and more successful. Like I said, your, your second book shredded. I, I, I grabbed it. I got it. I was engrossed. And I was, I'm sitting there going, this is a great book. I recommend it to people. We, we send it to people. In fact, if I have somebody that's asking me, I will send them a copy and say, just read this. And, uh, because I feel it's approachable. I feel that it gets the message out about what we do as far as being plant-based and, in a way that is understandable that you can be strong, you can accomplish your goals and you can be compassionate and you can be healthy. I think that, that, that you really rounded it up very well. And by spotlighting people that have done it, it's, it, it helps people get drive. So, you know, thank you. I, I really, I really think those case studies and transformation stories are a big part of the book. You know, it's not just me and, and my ideas and my programs, but it's, it is highlighting all those successful plant-based athletes and all those various chefs and cookbook authors that contributed greatly to the meal plans and to the recipes. Mm-hmm. It's, it's all of that uh, collaboration that I think shows that it's, uh, it's practical, it's accessible, it's uh, beneficial, and it's adaptable, and, and it's for anybody. And so I, I'm really excited, and Shred It's done really, really well. I mean, it, it outsold, I think, 75% of all of their books printed in, in the U.S. last year, according to some statistics that I read. So it's, uh, I feel pretty good about that. Awesome. Allows me, Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, it allows me to travel essentially every week. You know, leave, I leave in like uh, the day, no, I leave tomorrow. The day after tomorrow, I go. I, leave again. <laughs> I just got back from the cruise. And even before the cruise, I was in Colorado, Arizona, Oregon, and Canada in four consecutive days. Then back to Colorado, then over to Florida for the cruise. Now I'm back, and I'm off to... Nevada and Arizona um, next week, and then off to Southeast Asia for a bit. So, um, a lot of travels coming up. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We are Curiously Veg is pretty new, and we're here because we want to kind of bridge the gap between vegans, non-vegans, and we want to show, you know, highlight people like you and and, and the things that you do, and, and like at, in, you know, the farm sanctuary and even some of the local people that we have, some fighters that we have to, to kind of give that message that's easy to understand and promote those who are out doing the good work, those, those who found their why. And now yeah. your why can give other people their why and their how. But I, I do think that, you know, your book is excellent. And um, congratulations on the success. I'm, I'm very glad that it's successful. 
Thanks, Hope. I appreciate it.